Sure, I actually want to pick up pretty much where that conversation left off. I do think it's important to say that when we talk about balancing supply and demand in the housing market, like, while demand on paper has gone down, <clears throat> there aren't less people in Canada who need a place to live. So, I mean, demand for housing is completely inelastic. There's just as much demand for housing as there ever was. There's just more people living on the street who aren't bidding on houses because it's completely outside their financial possibility. And so I think it is important for us to recall <clears throat> as policymakers that in fact the demand for housing is equal to the number of people that live in Canada. The, the question of how many people are bidding on houses matters. I'm not saying that that isn't an important metric. But when we bring those two things into alignment so that there's roughly about a good number of people bidding on houses for the amount of supply, doesn't mean that demand has gone down. It means that people are just displaced out of the market and they're the people that we're seeing live in encampments in our cities and on the streets and everywhere else. And so I think it's important for us just to bear in mind that we're not really talking about a balancing of demand and supply. We're talking about demand segments disappearing off the ledger and living on the street. Um, one of the things that I think Canadians have really been challenged with when it comes to housing, like if we think about <clears throat> before interest rates went up, low interest rates, certainly there was a school of thought that would say low interest rates were raising the sticker price of houses and so in that sense contributing to housing inflation. Since interest rates have gone up, people have really been feeling the pinch because even though the sticker price may be coming down, their ongoing operating costs of owning a home and servicing the mortgage have also been an important driver of inflation. Now as we talk about a period on the horizon, albeit not sure when that's coming exactly, where interest rates will go down, are you concerned that that means housing will continue to drive inflation because as people can borrow more money with the same income, we'll go back to the race that was on before interest rates went up where sticker prices are quickly escalating, also driving people out of the uh, housing market. Uh, well, I think you, you've described actually the the, uh, the difficulty in the housing market quite well. Um, exactly as you described, when interest rates were very low, um, demand for housing was very strong. We saw a large appreciation uh, of house prices. Uh, you know, as you're well aware, house prices through COVID uh, went up more than 50% over two years. That wasn't all interest rates. Part of it was people wanted more space during COVID, but interest rates were certainly uh, a part of that. Um, and that actually pushed up a shelter price inflation. Shelter price inflation has actually been quite high for several years. What's changed with the increase in interest rates is the composition. Um, the, you know, it was largely because the house prices were going up a lot before, mortgage interest cost was very low. Uh, now mortgage interest cost is, is, is high, but house prices are not going up uh, very much. They came down a little bit and they've kind of stabilized. They're going up slowly. So I, mean, wh I think also what to get a little bit back to um, Mr. St. Marie's question, I think what this highlights is you're not going to solve housing with low interest rates and you're not going to solve it with high interest rates. We've tried both. Uh, and we've had high shelter price inflation. And, and it comes back to, you know, the durable solution is to increase the supply. And that includes both supply of homes and the supply of uh, purpose-built built rental. Do you think that it's something government should be contemplating? And of course, like, if you have any suggestions, we're very happy to hear them. But even in a general sense, if government has a sense that at some point interest rates are going to begin to come down, you know, is there a set of policy tools that, like, is there a difference in terms of what policy tools might help with rapid kind of sticker price inflation in housing versus the inflation that we've seen over the last number of years where interest rates have been higher? Is there, is there a different kind of toolbox that government should be looking to as they prepare for a potential change in direction of the bank? Are there tools that make more sense now, given the nature of the, of the problem that we're facing around renewals versus how do I get enough to bid on a new home? Um, well, uh, you know, we're, not, we're not experts in housing policy, but I, I think the message is it's policies that are focused on supply, 
um, are going to, to help fix the situation. Policies that uh, are focused more on demand uh, are simply going to make the situation worse uh, because prices will just start going up, uh, making houses less affordable. The, the, you know, it's really very much policies that are focused on supply, and that w does require um, an unusual level of cooperation between the municipal, provincial, and federal governments because the instruments on supply are spread out across different levels of government. So something like a first home buyer's uh, savings account or something like that would be an example of a demand side measure, whereas uh, recapitalizing the co-investment fund, which has been uh, important to be able to build various kinds of non-market housing across the country would be an example of a, of a supply side measure. Is that kind of a fair? Uh, I think that's, that's reasonable. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. I don't know how much time I have. Six I minutes. So, but, uh, that, that, so we're, yeah, we're finished with this okay, round. Thank I, you. I know, uh, in an earlier comment, you were saying that you would like to be in a position to bring down interest rates. And I think again, with the, with a potential lowering at some point on the horizon it kind of raises the question. I know that the bank, you know, has an inflation target, but is there something that you consider to be an ideal interest rate? And, you know, as you think about this moving forward, and we know that there are many, you know, there are a lot of reasons for why we've experienced inflation. Some of them are under government's control, others aren't. Um, and we know that difficult economic times are, are certainly possible, if not likely, in the, in the years uh, and decades to come. So, you know, one of the tools that the bank has sometimes used in times of uh, slower economic activity has been to reduce rates in order to stimulate economic activity. So at what point do you get concerned that that's not a tool in the toolbox if interest rates are too low? And do you have an idea of where you want to land in terms of uh, an interest rate amount in the short or medium term? Um. <clears throat> I'm not sure I fully understood your question, so eh, stop me if I'm. Um, so, look, we, we don't we don't have a target for the interest rate. We have a target for inflation. Uh, the ideal interest rate is the one that gets us to two percent inflation. Uh, you know what that's going to be, though, because the interest rate is the instrument. What that interest rate is going to be that gets us to low stable inflation is going to depend on what happens in the economy. Uh, we do very much worry about um, the risks on both sides. So inflation's been, been too high. We've, we've taken forceful action. We've raised our interest rates. Um, we are committed to getting inflation all the way back to 2%. Um, and so we, you know, we want to make sure that we, we do enough. And we, we, we don't want to sort of drop rates prematurely, realize that we're not going to get back to 2% inflation, and then have to raise them again in the future. Um, on the other hand, we don't want to leave them high for so long that, you know, the economy cools a lot more than it needs to, and inflation actually in that case would probably fall below our target. Uh, so it is a difficult judgment. Um, you know, we spend a lot of our time discussing, you know, are we doing too much? Are we doing too little? How much, how much more do we have to do? So that, that is really <clears throat> the center of, of our deliberations. So does that mean, if I'm hearing your answer right, that the bank wouldn't really consider a lowering of the interest rate until you felt that there was a risk of deflationary pressure? Or um, if inflation returns to target and is forecast to be on target for the foreseeable future, would you entertain a lowering of the interest rate? Or does that begin to take into consider consideration factors outside of the simple rate of inflation? Well, you know, as inflation moves towards the target, we shouldn't need interest rates as restrictive as they are uh, because they will have done their work and we're getting there. So in terms of you know, how we think about it, um, as I've stressed a number of times, there are lags in the effects of monetary policy. What we do now affects the economy over the next year and a half. So we don't want to wait until inflation's all the way back to two before we start cutting interest rates. Because if we did that, we would overshoot. We'd go below 2% inflation. We'd cool the economy more than we have to. So yes, you do want to start lowering interest rates uh, before you're all the way back. But you don't want to lower them until you're convinced, you're assured that you're really on a path to get there. And that, that's really 
that's where we are right now. We're looking for that insurance. It's working. We don't think we need to raise rates further, okay. but uh, we need to let it work. Uh, and when we see that assurance, you really let them go. We'll have yeah, yeah. Where is he? Hands off here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, P. Blakey, Governor. Like and uh, so I have two questions. The first, I hope you may be able to answer just in follow up to the committee. I doubt that you'll have the answer today. Um, and the second, I hope to get your comment on today. So the first, you know, uh, New Democrats support carbon pricing of some in some way, shape or form. Don't always agree with the government on exactly how they're doing it. But we have proposed to remove the GST on home heating. Now you've been able to calculate what the one time effect on inflation would be of removing the carbon tax. Wondering if you might be able to calculate what the one time effect of removing GST on home heating would be. We prefer that option because it applies to all Canadians, including ones who use renewable energy in order to heat their home, like hydroelectricity, for example. We prefer that approach because it applies in all parts of the country. As you know, the federal carbon price only applies in some parts of the country and not others, like British Columbia, for example. So eliminating the carbon tax on home heating doesn't do anything for Canadians who are living in provinces with their own carbon tax regime. So that's why we prefer the GST approach, and I would be very curious to get the bank's opinion on what the inflationary effect of removing GST from home heating on all forms of home heating would in fact be, and then we could um, have a bit of a comparison in terms of that, that approach. And to Mr. Lawrence's point, because the GST is applied on the carbon tax, it would also have a mitigating effect on the carbon price increases going forward, albeit it wouldn't completely eliminate them. So if you might be able to return to the committee in writing on that point, that would be very uh, much appreciated. The second question has to do with the climate change discussion that was had earlier. Canada is notoriously behind some of our training partners, particularly in Europe, but I think also arguably the Americans, on having a taxonomy for classifying various kinds of green investment and for having uh, a requirement for uh, corporate publicly disclosed uh, corporate transition plans. Um, so I wonder if you could speak to the utility of having those publicly disclosed plans required of Canadian companies and having a clear established uh, taxonomy for the bank to be able to do the work that you were talking about in terms of trying to better incorporate climate effects into your own forecasting. Um, well, look, the climate policy taxonomy are really, um, you know, in the in the in the realm of elected officials. I, I, look, as a general comment, I think uh, you know, disclosure, um, having agreed upon sort of rules of the road, a taxonomy, so that people can you know, agree on okay what this is relative to that. I think those are useful bits of infrastructure uh, that would, you know, allow people to make more informed decisions, uh, allow for uh, you know, more informed investment decisions. Uh, so I do think those things uh, would generally be helpful, yes. UMP.